Well, what a blessing to have uh, Father Noiseau with us tonight. Father, uh, um, with his bishop's permission, spent six years from 1988 to 1994 with the canons regular of the Holy Cross in Portugal. The Holy Cross directs the church, church approved Opus Angelorum Apostolate, which promotes devotion to the holy angels. Father's gonna to talk to us tonight about the guardian angel window. So it sounds like he has uh, special uh, qualifications to do just that. Uh, a warm welcome to Father Noiseau. He is a priest of the Diocese of Springfield. We're very blessed to have him here tonight. Thank you, Father. I'd invite you to begin with the Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Father Henry, and also I'd like to acknowledge Kerry Morton, who did so much work to prepare for this wonderful series that you've been having here at St. Michael's. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> I'm very lucky because I had a generous friend who gave me a ride over here, and the last thing that he said as we were walking up the sidewalk was, would you mind if I prayed the rosary during your talk? I said, no, not at all. And that stimulated a memory that I hadn't thought of in 30 years. When I was told this little story, there was a priest who was known to be a good speaker, and people were always edified by his conferences and his homilies. He always had with him a friar or a brother, not a priest, who would accompany him and never said a word. The conferences were always well delivered. The people were very uplifted. But on one occasion, the same priest fell flat his remarks were not so edifying, they weren't so mesmerizing. And then it was realized that that brother that always accompanied him was not there because he was sick. So that in large measure, the success of the priest's preaching was due to the prayers of the brother that always accompanied him. So that if I don't do well tonight, I'll think, hmm, that rosary wasn't prayed fervently enough. Well, the window that we have this evening is the guardian angel window, and here's how I'd like to try to structure uh, my remarks tonight. If I had an expertise in art, I imagine that I'd be able to approach the window a little differently, uh, highlighting especially those artistic features. I don't have that ability, but I can make some observations based on the window. But more importantly for my purposes, I'll use the window as a springboard to a consideration, a meditation on our guardian angel, which is the theme of the window. But in order for us to appreciate the guardian angel, it might be helpful to have a review, a summary of the mystery of the angelic world. Now, perhaps some of you know far more about the angels than I do, and perhaps some of you know less than I do. So I hope this review will be helpful no matter what category we are in. The angels, as you know, are pure spirits. Now here's where it gets tricky. By pure spirit, in this context, we mean a being that is entirely, completely spiritual without any matter. So all of the angels are pure spirits in this way, including the fallen angels, who we call demons or devils, because they also have no matter. There's nothing material about them. However, we sometimes refer to the fallen angels as impure spirits because they have been tainted, scarred with sin. So that a pure spirit 
is a being that is entirely spiritual without any connection to matter. That is their nature. God made them that way. We were created with a nature that combines matter and spirit. And we know that everything God has made is good. And for that reason, matter is good too, because it's something that God has made. And all the more because Jesus Christ, the incarnate word, took upon himself our human nature, he had a created body and a created soul. Yes, the soul of Jesus Christ was created, but, but united to the body and soul of Christ was the divine nature. So all of the angels are entirely spiritual in this sense. We might then go back to the very beginning of time when God created all of the angels and he created all of them good. But there was a kind of probation. God wanted the angels to freely choose to serve him. And remember, the highest dignity that we have as created beings is to serve God. The world would have us believe it's a kind of enslavement as if God somehow needs our service. <clears throat> but rather, it is in serving God that we achieve the freedom that we really long for. So to serve God is a great privilege. How is it that it is said in sacred scripture, a third of the angels defected, a third of the angels rejected God's invitation, and thus they were cast out of heaven forever uh, to be in hell, which was created for the fallen angels, not for fallen human beings, although we can end up there too. So, Many of the spiritual writers over the centuries have proposed this notion, which many hold to, although we're not bound to receive it as something infallibly taught. But many of the saints were of the opinion that the trial of the angels involved God revealing to them his plan. And it all sounded very nice to the angels until God came to the part about the incarnation. Excuse me for trying to clear my throat. <clears throat> the part of the incarnation. Now here we're going to pause for an instant because we know that our Lord became incarnate to redeem us. But there is a school of theology amongst the Franciscans and we are able to believe this opinion as well. It's the opinion I believe, which is that even if there had not been sin, and even if Christ had not needed to come to us as our Redeemer, it was always his plan to come amongst his created beings in the incarnate mystery. However, it would not have required physical suffering and bloodshed, as was the case because of our redemption being accomplished. So the angels are shown this vision, this preview of what God has in store. And it's quite insulting to the pridefulness of some of the angels, especially Lucifer, because they can see serving God, but to serve him in such a lowly human nature, it's just too bitter a pill to swallow. And what even makes it worse is that his mother, our Lord's mother, a mere human being, not a divine person like Christ, would be higher than the angels. Well, that's a little bit too much to have a created being, a woman in particular, over the angels. No, count me out, so many of them said. Now, here's the part that always puzzled me, and it was only when I was in middle age, which was a while ago already, that I found out the answer that had always puzzled me. It just goes to prove that these kind of things are no longer taught in seminaries. But I wonder to myself, how could it be that the devil would have thought that he could take the place of God? He knows that God is all powerful. He knows that God can do whatever he wills. And in the prophet Isaiah, God speaking to the prophet says, I will not give my glory to another. God isn't going to resign. He's not going to move aside for something which in its own essence and being is nothing because God holds us all in existence by his will. 
If he were to forget us for an instant, we would disappear. So how could it be that the devil thought he could get away with such a bold plan? And I found the answer in St. Bernard. At the time of the testing of the angels, there had been no need or occasion for God to manifest his vengeance. Yes, God does exercise vengeance, although that's not a popular theory today or popular reality to hear. So the devil, from our way of thinking, would have thought, well, God will just have to put up with it. He's so nice. He's so accommodating. He's so gracious. I will just take over and he can move aside happily. And it was in that instant that the devil and his minions had the occasion to see the truth of the matter and they were cast immediately like lightning falling from the heavens into the depths of hell, which was created at that moment for them. Now, why is it the angels that fell were not able to be forgiven? Interestingly, Anne Catherine Emmerich the mystic who has had so many visions of creation and the mysteries of the Bible and redemption, said that immediately after the fall, the angels who had remained faithful to God prayed for the conversion of the fallen ones. This is Anne Catherine Emmerich. We're not obliged to believe this, but it shows, it shows a theological point. But that wasn't possible because angels are unlike human beings. When we make a decision, we very rarely have the full amount of information that might be helpful for us. Imagine you voted for a particular candidate, and then a week later you find out something about their political life that makes you think, wow, if I had known that, I never would have voted for him or her, because you never had the full amount of information that would have been helpful for you to make the decision. I would have never planned to have the picnic next week if I'd known we were going to have a hurricane that day. So all of these things impede our ability to make a decision with complete knowledge. But the angelic intellect is different. The angels, when they were given this proof, this test by God, knew every possible fact that was necessary for them to choose the way they had decided ultimately to choose. And so for that reason, they can't change their minds because it's not part of their nature. Now, from our way of looking at things, it seems almost as if it's a restriction, as if it's a disadvantage, because sometimes we change our minds about things, but that's not an aspect of the angelic intellect that is so far beyond our own intellect that we cannot begin to comprehend that mystery. So once the angels had chosen, that choice was irrevocable. It could never be taken back because they didn't want to take it back. They were fixed in that sin. However, God did not deprive them of certain natural abilities they had. And as an aspect of our own trial as human beings, God allowed the devils to tempt us. But again, their ability to tempt us is always, always within the parameters of what God will allow because they can never tempt us beyond our strength or our ability. They can tempt us so as to enable us perhaps to perceive a weakness. For example, it's often said that, especially regarding chastity, if people are very proud if they're very puffed up, they might be thinking that they're very virtuous. Sometimes God allows them to have a big fall, not because he's happy for that, but rather to bring them to their senses that they might appreciate, I'm not as chaste as I thought I was. St. Teresa of Avila is very emphatic about this kind of thing. She'll say, any virtue that we have is borrowed from God. I might think I'm very patient, it doesn't take very much for me to be disproven. So we're always able to fail even in an area where we think we've grown to some degree in virtue. So the demons are allowed to test us, not that we might fall, but so that in the grace of God, we might be able to depend on his help, the help of our angel, the help of the Blessed Mother to remain to 
continue to be faithful. So we see then the angelic world is something beyond our ability to grasp with our imaginations even. St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that each angel, each angel is a separate species. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a dog, for example. If we were to see a dog, we are immediately able to recognize this as a dog, even though there are many varieties of dogs, many breeds of dogs, there's some common characteristic that enables us to identify them as a dog, similarly with cats and so forth. However, each of these, a dog, is a species. And we have these varieties that are incorporated under that species. But with the angels, each angel is so unique, each angel is so distinctive, that each angel alone constitutes its very own species. This is St. Thomas teaching, and what he's really telling us is the variety, the splendor, the magnificence of each angel is so amazing. They are each in their own unique and distinctive category. It's something wonderful to meditate upon. And this helps us, I think, to a degree, to try at least to meditate upon the incomprehensible splendor of the Blessed Virgin because the church has always taught and believed that Our Lady exceeds all of the angels together in holiness and in beauty and in intellect, in every natural ability. Imagine that. However, as St. Louis de Montfort, the great champion of Our Lady would teach us, even then, Our Lady, as spectacular as she is, as marvelous as she is, as deserving as she is of our veneration, a sight of God, she is still, as St. Louis de Montfort says, less than an atom. She is nothing. All of us are nothing. As Christ told St. Catherine of Siena, remember that I am who am, and you are who is not. God doesn't tell us that to put us down, but to remind us of how magnificent he is. So the angelic world is something marvelous, unfortunately, not sufficiently meditated upon, reflected upon. You know, you look at old paintings from the medieval days, and you'll see images of the angels pushing around the planets. And this is discounted today as a primitive belief. I personally believe that it is true that in some mysterious way, God uses secondary agents the angels are not God directly, but acting through the mediation, through the, the assistance of the angel. And I'm sure the angels do, in fact, have much to do with the ordering of the universe. That's what the church always believed. It makes perfect sense because God created these magnificent beings that they might assist him in the work of creation. So what is the end of an angel. By an end, I mean the purpose for which something was created. It's the same with Our Lady. What is Our Lady's end? What is the purpose for which Our Lady was created? Our Lady was created to know, love, and serve God in this life, as our old Baltimore Catechism would teach us, so as to be happy with Him forever in the next. So Our Lady is not an end in herself, we don't stop at our Blessed Mother, but we pass through her on to a deeper appreciation, a deeper adoration of God. And similarly so with the angels. The angels assist us in this quest to know, love, and serve God in this world so that we might be happy with him forever and the next. <clears throat> so it is in this context then that we can consider the guardian angels all of these windows are marvelous. Carrie had pointed out that the windows with the angels do not have the plants on them. Interestingly, I'm looking at our Lord here, and there, is, there are plants on each side of him. And the angels don't have a plant. Our Lady doesn't. I assume that perhaps that might have meant that the angels are not of this world, they minister to us, but they are not of this world. They are from a heavenly realm, and so therefore 
they wouldn't have the plants by their side. That's something that you can reflect on. We notice that in the image of the guardian angel, the guardian angel is depicted as a male, as a man or young man. Now we know that angels are pure spirits and as pure spirits, they have no body. They will never have a body. Here's a big misunderstanding that Christians sometimes make in these days of being uninformed. People think, oh, in heaven will be angels. No, no, no. Our Lord said in heaven, you will be like angels, like angels in the sense that in heaven, all of the angels are without sin. All of the angels know and love and serve God. All of the angels are perfectly happy. So we will never become angels because angels never had bodies. And we won't be really happy until we get our bodies back at the resurrection of the just. So angels do not have bodies. Why then are the angels always depicted in the masculine? And I think this is a very, very important consideration today in these, these very trying times that we're living through. The church has always depicted angels in the masculine because in all of the Bible, where the angels are mentioned from the first book of the Bible to the last book of the Bible, in innumerable occasions, no matter how carefully you scour the Bible, the image is always in the masculine because the angels are associated with the ministry of Christ. Everything was created for Christ, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ. And so the angels in a particular way are ordered to the ministry of Christ. This is the way that God designed it. Now, when God created the universe, being God, he doesn't think as we do in steps. First, I think this, and then as a consequence, I come to this next conclusion and so forth. No, every possibility imaginable is always present before God. So when he decided to create the universe before God was every possible conceivable kind of universe imaginable to his infinite mind, he didn't have to work out step by step. It was all there. So when God created the universe, when he created this world that we live in, when he created male and female, already in his mind was the desire to reflect some aspect of his infinite truth in his creation. So that fatherhood, for example, God was not working with existing categories that he had to deal with his kind of images and concepts. No, he created those categories to reveal himself. And so it was always in God's mind that the earthly father would in some way mirror or represent the heavenly father. And the blessed virgin and women were to image the mystery of the church. St. Paul tells us that Christ laid down his life in love for his spouse, which is the church. So this is not arbitrary. We have no ability, no right to change the categories that God has revealed to us. I was reading last week <clears throat> that someone in the Anglican church no longer wanted to pray our father, but some other designation. That's a terrible blasphemy because God chose to reveal himself as father. And it's the responsibility of men who have children to try as best as they can to mirror, to image the in love of our Heavenly Father and similarly too with the priest who in a greater way already is called to mirror the love of the Father. So these are categories that God has given. So in the Bible, the angels are always in every case referred to directly as looking like men when they make the appearances to people and they take on the appearance of a body for the sake of those who are witnessing them. That's the difference. Christ had an actual human body capable of suffering. The angels put on the appearance of a body for the sake of those who will be witnessing their apparition to them. So in some cases, the male or female might not be specifically mentioned, but the roles, for example, 
the angel of the Lord in the book of Kings slayed like 140,000 Assyrians in one night. That is a militaristic action. That is an action of the angel which is associated with the role of men. So this isn't my opinion. This isn't something I'm making up, but it's something that has been revealed to us. And I've noticed in the last 40 years, because I've been following the angels in that way for about 40 years in a particular manner, and I've noticed that more and more you will see images of angels that are trivialized. They become very silly. They become very demeaning to the dignity, the stature, the magnific magnificent holiness of the angel. I've seen, for example, on Christmas cards, a charming little five-year-old girl who was quite delightful, but they put angel wings on her and have us understand this as a kind of representation of the angel. It's not paying service to the truth, but it's worse than that because when angels are depicted in the feminine, it always is connected with a pagan or an occultish or even a demonic religion. Not too long ago, I was at a secondhand store and they had kind of placed the angel statues together in one location, various types and varieties, and there was an angel statue of a woman as an angel with abundant naked breasts. That has never, ever been the custom in Catholic art because it does not represent the truth as revealed to us in sacred scripture and in sacred tradition. So this is a more important question than we would immediately perceive because it's to blur this whole distinction between male and female. Now, interestingly, the soul, the human soul is always, always in the feminine. So if you were to speak of some kind of male that, ex that is extremely virile, manly, his soul is still referred to as she. If you come across that in spiritual writing, it's not because someone is becoming modern, it's always been that way. Whether or not you are a man or a woman, your soul is always referred to in the feminine. The reason being that the feminine is the receptive quality. And all of us, whether or not we are men or women, have to receive the grace that God freely gives. We are not the authors or we do not act on that, but it's something we have to receive willingly that God is anxious to give us. So another aspect of the angel, this isn't essential, but I thought it was interesting that the angel and the young man in the guardian angel window are both depicted barefoot. And to me, that made sense because it's no longer bound to a particular time. Sometimes in art, for example, I had seen a depiction of the repentant man coming to Christ for forgiveness, and he was kneeling at our Lord's side to receive consolation, but he was dressed up like an individual would be dressed up in the 1970s. So immediately, you're brought back to a particular concrete historical time, and the encounter that we have with Christ is outside of time. It's always always today. And so therefore, by having the angel without a particular specific footwear, you're not binding the angel to a particular time and circumstance. We notice, too, that the angel has a kind of headband with a star on the top in the front. That reminded me to a degree of the mystery of the phylacteries that are spoken of in sacred scriptures, whereby from the book of Deuteronomy, our Lord is saying, I am the Lord your God. You shall love me with your whole heart and your whole mind and your whole soul. Bind this on your wrist and around your forehead as a pendant. And the Jews of our Lord's time would literally do that as a reminder to hold before them always that mandate of God in this marvelous reminder. So in a similar way, I saw that as a kind of crown that the angel wears, but also as a constant reminder that the angel loves God with his whole heart and mind and soul. And the angel is pointing upward. 
to the young man at his side as if to say, my job, my responsibility, my privilege is to point you upward to heavenly realities, to heavenly realms. And so the angel is a marvelous helper. But I think today we have the tendency to trivialize the grandeur of the angel. It's like poor St. Anthony. It's somewhat analogous in my perspective. Okay, St. Anthony is a giant of a saint who is Portuguese, by the way. He was born in Lisbon. And that's a long story, but I say that because many people think St. Anthony was Italian because of his being in, the, in, in Italy with St. Francis. But St. Anthony is a giant of a saint. He was the first Franciscan teacher because St. Francis didn't want his friars to have higher education because he was worried they might become prideful. But when he saw the humility of Anthony, he thought, hmm, it is possible to study and to be humble. So St. Anthony was the first teacher of the friars, of the Franciscans. But here he is, a great saint, and what do we reduce him to? Looking for our lost items. Well, I don't have a problem with that because I do it myself. Don't worry, more than once. And as you get older, you have that greater need for finding lost items. But the point I'm making is we can take one aspect of the saint and put it out of proportion. St. Anthony should be remembered for far, far, far more than that. And similarly with our guardian angel, we can reduce him to a kind of uh, water boy looking for our lost items or whatever. But what is the real desire of the holy angel? What is the real desire of our own personal guardian angel? Our angel wants us to know, love, and serve God. And I think especially at Holy Mass, you know, with the Christmas angels saying, glory to God in the highest and peace to people of goodwill. That's the biblical origin of the Gloria that we pray at Mass on Sundays. And so the angel was assisting us in the adoration and in the worship of God, especially beginning on that very first Christmas night. And so our holy angel is very, very anxious, very desirous that we would worship God. Because as I mentioned earlier, to worship God is the origin of all of the happiness that we can long for in this life or in the next. It's something that's liberating, that's freeing, that brings us joy, not something that restricts us. And so the angel helps us through our conscience by enlightening the conscience. But here's the key. Not conscience in the sense of some subjective reality where the conscience is whatever I want the truth to be. No, a true conscience is that which is formed according to the truth revealed by Christ and preserved in the church. And so we have to study the faith that we might have a well-formed conscience, and then our angel is able to help us all the more. Well, I'm going to conclude in a moment, but just a few thoughts on the holy angel that might be a little bit helpful for us with questions that people have. Here's an important one. People sometimes want to name their guardian angel. And the church very specifically said, no, no, you can't do that. And there are a couple very important reasons for this. First of all, it would be possible for someone inadvertently, by accident, to choose a name for their angel, which in actual fact is a demonic name because we don't always know. But there's something more important. A superior being names someone of less stature and dignity. Take Adam, when all of the animals were presented to him. Adam named those animals, because to name represents having a profound understanding of their essence of their being. And it was in naming the animals that Adam realized that not one of them was suitable or deserving of him. And then it was that God created woman because she was worthy of him. Two creatures in God's eyes on equal footing. So the one doing the naming 
is the one of greater stature. Stature, parents name their children. It's the parents that give the name. So naming often implies also a certain power that you have over someone. If you're a school teacher, immediately you want to learn the names of the children so you can say, oh, Bob or Jill, instead of saying, oh, you with the red sweater on in the second row, having the child's name automatically gives us a certain advantage, a good advantage, a holy advantage. And so for that reason, the church says, no, you, you cannot name your angel because it would be as if to imply that we have a greater dignity or statue stature than our angel has. So that's an important consideration because it's a question that people often um, think of today. So we don't uh, assign names to our angel. How is it that we can increase the ability of the angel to assist us? It's very simple, by asking our angel's assistance, because that requires a certain degree of humility which is always pleasing to God. In other words, if we ask the angel to assist us, we're in faith acknowledging that A, number one, we believe that we have an angel. And number two, we're acknowledging we believe that the angel will help us, can help us, and wants to help us. So the angel is pleased, God is pleased by our humility in requesting assistance from our guardian angel that the angel might help us in our particular needs. And here's the thought that I would come toward a conclusion with. The angels that God gives us are a particular manifestation or representation of God's divine providence. And very sad to say, a great proportion of Catholics today, including those who come to Mass all of the time, including those who come to conferences, I know that too many of us no longer have a real conviction and belief in God's divine providence. For example, take the whole lie of overpopulation. If we know God and serve God, he never will punish us by providing for too few goods for the world to sustain us, quite the opposite because God's providence already has determined the exact number of human beings that will live until the very last day. That has been already chosen by God. It's already been determined by God. So his providence oversees all things. Our Lord tells us that not a hair of your head falls without your father knowing it. He's counted them all. Not a sparrow falls from the sky without your heavenly father knowing it. So a greater confidence, a greater belief in God's divine providence is very helpful for our peace of mind, especially in these days where we believe that so many things are out of control. So our angel is assigned to us by God as a part of that mystery of his providence, God wants to give us every possible help that we might arrive safely at our heavenly destination. So I'm sure that already, many of you all already and for some time have had a devotion to your guardian angel. It's not such a difficult thing to do. It's just turning your heart and mind on occasion to your angel, asking your angel to help you. Pope John the 23rd, used to have the habit, especially before he had an important meeting, he would pray to his guardian angel and to the guardian angels of the ones who would be coming in for the meeting that with their help, all might go as well as possible. And remember, there's no competition between Our Lady and the angels. Our Lady is the queen of the angels. She directs them they look to her for guidance. So how wonderful we're here and how wonderful it would be if we would frequently ask our guardian angel to help us that we might be more faithful to Jesus Christ and the mystery of the incarnation. So we'll end with that prayer that I'm sure you already know. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love entrusts me here, 
ever this day be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide, amen. And you know, it's exactly six o'clock, so it would be perfect to conclude with the Angelus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. <clears throat> Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. And the Word was made flesh. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection through the same Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father Henry said that sometimes you might have questions. If I could, I'd be happy to try to... Very good. Yes? Okay, the question is, God assigns an angel to people. Is that just for Christians? Well, here's a clue for you. I'm going to give you the answer, but I just read it yesterday. The Opus Angelorum, which is Latin for work of the holy angels, that's the group I was with that Father Henry mentioned, Opus, O-P-U-S, Angelorum, A-N-G-E-L-O-R-U-M. Even if you get it close on the Google search engine or whatever search engine you use, it will come up. But it's a very good site which has a lot of questions and answers and information about the holy angels and the guardian angels. And this was one of the questions in a question and answer format that I read yesterday on their website. So. Is it just Christians who receive a guardian angel? The church has not defined anything particularly about that that we are obliged to hold to to consider ourselves Catholic, but there are general opinions that we can take with some degree of weight. And according to what I read on the site, many of the teachers of the church, when I say teachers of the church, I mean those the church fathers, those who taught in the early centuries and the, and the saints, were of the opinion that even non-Christians receive an angel. And I'm sure that this would be for the reason that the angel might try to assist that individual to come to the truth of Christ, to recognize the church that he has established. So we have reason to believe that, in answer to your question, that every individual may have received an angel. Again, this is um, not in the area of something as an infallibly taught truth. Yes, and the, there are two men in the back, the one furthest in the back, and then we'll go to the... Thank you for that question. I'll repeat it for the sake of the recording. The question is that in popular media, you will often see a bad angel on one side of an individual, a good angel on the other. And I was asked what my opinion might be in that matter. There does seem to be sufficient evidence that 
there were saints who were of the opinion that there could be something along these lines. However, I wouldn't think that God in any way would have assigned someone to tempt us, but rather that he would have allowed the evil one to send people to tempt us. And so I've seen those myself in old cartoons as a child, one angel, the holy angel, trying to admonish the soul for the good thing, and the other angel, the fallen angel, admonishing toward the opposite. But I think in actual fact, however this happens, it does represent the truth of the matter. Yes, we ultimately have God's assistance to act according to the truth, but there are outside forces the communion of saints which assist us and the fallen angels which try to trip us up. So I don't know if that answers your question. And the gentleman who also, yes. That's an excellent question, and it's interesting you should bring it up because I did notice the, the uh, size of the feet. So let me allow you to answer first the part that I know and then to perhaps consider some possibilities for what I don't know. First of all, the angels were created in one instant by God. They never age. They never change. They can, they had what's called infused knowledge, meaning that when God created the angels, similar to what happened with Adam and Eve, they had infused knowledge. God had put this knowledge into their being that they did not have to learn by experience. So the angels have a tremendous amount of infused knowledge, but they also can learn by experience. Interestingly, St. Francis de Sales is of the opinion that an angel can even learn from a homily at Mass. The point is, God allows the angels in humility to learn from us lowly human beings. So the angels are without age, so it stands to reason that the angel would be depicted as a man at his prime. But the feet, very interesting. We see the feet in sacred scripture as representative of uh, have the feet that bring the good news, happy or blessed are the feet that bring the good news. But so far as the reason that the artist would have, I don't know. That, that's an excellent um, observation. It's something that we can think about. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes, I don't know. Yes. Yeah. I know that with the group that I was with that was devoted to preaching about the holy angels and they tried to align their teaching with that of St. Thomas and the fathers of the church and the saints, they were of the opinion, which makes sense to me, that each guardian angel is assigned one charge so that they wouldn't have an, another assignment later on. In other words, you'd serve as a guardian angel for that one time. And then in heaven, if we get there, they would be forever our companions in a very special way because think your angel has known every single moment of your existence from the time that you were in your mother's womb. That's amazing. But the mysterious part is, and I wouldn't know how even to begin meditating on this because I've tried, the poor angel who faithfully tried to bring that soul to accept the grace of Christ 
and then that soul is lost. It's not lost because of any negligence of the angel. It's lost because of the malice of the individual. So I'm sure God in some way compensates them or rewards them in some way that we don't know. But um, does that answer your question? I think that Father is probably thinking that you have something yet to do. And so um, I thank you very much for your questions. And uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. God bless you.